essentially. Like if you're trying to study all one thing primarily, it's yeah. good to start, but then sometimes you need to branch out to make other connections is how I experience it. Like I would say it's right to start out that way with a focused plan with a specifically about those lectures you go through. But I think you reach a point where you need to parallel learn with something else or that you should start bringing in other things in a field that you want to learn and understand. Because then you could see those things in action in a practical way. Like you're right. trying, you would be taking what you've learned and starting to apply it more so. Because you do have a lot of knowledge now. And I think you have enough to start having a working understanding of what to do when you're applying it to what matters to you, the, the specifics in your life. And that's how I think I experienced learning objectivism. I mean, I did a lot of it at once. Like all the books by Rand, books by Peacock and Tara Smith, that is like, like in the span of three years, I did like, I stuffed myself full with so much of that. <laughs> but since then, not nearly as much. Like I've gone in other fields, a lot more about psychology, for right. instance. Right. And at first I wasn't really doing psychology. It was all objectivism really to start. And then I branched out to start grounding my thinking, finding other problems to, to solve within philosophy, things right. like that. Okay. So you're saying there needs to be some content which I apply it to, but given that it's such a broad field, I should be able to apply it to anything from making tea to cleaning the house in theory, uh, even though those yeah, are mundane, but different ex extents. mundane examples. Yeah. It depends what you want to focus on Yeah, though, okay. like which, what in objectivism or philosophy, I mean, yeah, abstract, you could apply it to many things, but say, I think a specific area helps because then you, a specific goal in your life, then it starts yeah. to apply. Yeah. more directly you see the application more directly right yeah okay all right well i'm gonna do one thing i'm gonna change is do more i in the art of thinking lecture leonard peikoff was saying that sometimes when he was confused he would write and he would write for himself so it was putting aside any considerations of communications of communication and sometimes he would, he said he, there were points where he wrote 300 pages. And so if, if he's doing that, it's good to know though, because I wouldn't have even thought that was, I didn't, you know, I, I'm, I can sit here and write two pages about something I'm confused about. And I think that's a lot of work, but he was saying that there were times when, I think it was something about the, he even mentioned at one point he was confused about how you can something about water being oh, the essence of how you can identify the essence of water. I can't exa I can't remember the example, but the point is it was some seemingly irrelevant detail. And he said he ended, he was so confused by it when he spoke to Ayn Rand that he ended up writing 30 pages about his confusions. And then she would go over it with him and they would find the one line of reasoning where he was wrong. And so, but taking that into account, it does seem like writing it, like you read something and then, spend tons of time writing about it seems to be one thing that I haven't done, but will add, because I can see, I just didn't know it was possible to write so much about your own confusions for yourself. Yeah. I mean, I see, I mean, a lot of people would have a, a journal of their own just to write down ideas of whatever crosses their mind. Like that's kind of how a similar thing. I know, you know Da Vinci did that primarily. Yeah. I have a notebook too. I just, I don't really consider what who's reading it. It's just, it's to remind myself. So I don't forget things. It's just, I slap it down and go over it again later. Yeah. Things like that. But it okay. certainly always helps to have something beyond studying philosophy that you're using this for, that you're thinking about. Yeah. That way you get examples, you get things to connect it with. You're seeing the way this has to do with real life. It's not yeah. just a abstract theory. It's actually supposed to be functional, it's supposed to help you think better and to be better as a person. Yeah. That's what it's supposed to do. So whatever field it might be, I mean, that's the good thing with 
to ground philosophy, you can really pick any field you like, anything that's uh, compatible with your your goals in, right. in life. Right. Okay. All right. So it seems like uh, we can go back to my original, uh, the purpose I wrote down, which was the analysis of fiction and art through the lens of philosophy, which I still haven't got around to, but that seemed yeah. to be... Um, one thing but then so it's okay so you're advocating content and the only thing i added after listening to that out of thinking lecture is right about my confusion so the questions come out and i don't necessarily have answers but i know okay this is what i'm not clear on and so i just put it aside and keep studying and with that in mind that's yeah, my... yeah so keep in mind that peacock wanted to be a professional philosopher that is his field anyway yeah. like that's what he went to school for yeah that's what he wants to solve primarily yeah. So it makes sense for him to just figure out confusions or really put it out there to sort through it. Whereas you might focus more on developing something for, or some other end than professional philosopher, whatever. I get that. Be. Yeah, I get that distinction. Uh, it, it's definitely something I have to keep in mind because I do get carried away sometimes. However, I would say that there is a professional philosopher, but there is also, at least my understanding is that some of like, for example, an idea as broad as objectivity, it would make sense for me to be very clear and explicit on when it yes. applies, when I'm doing it, when I'm not doing it. And if I can't then, but to, the, to go into a minor detail, like the essence of water or how you can describe water in terms of other concepts. Yeah, okay, I might not get into that, but. The, the just even the core ideas I'm sometimes finding right. like you know I wouldn't if I don't have a very I've got an abstract understanding I can rattle off a few a few formulations and so on but it's it's not um uh it's not immediately usable for me so that that's my main concern but yeah good I agree with your point on uh, he was a professional philosopher so his approach would be different from mine yeah okay uh, this is just a section from the Brandon, Barbara Brandon's thinking, uh, her thinking, transcribed lectures on thinking. I, a lot of the examples she gives, like there's a lot of good material in there, but there are a lot of examples that just leave me a little bit confused and stumped and uh, disagreeing with her. And so I, I was curious to get your thoughts on what she's saying here. So basically, oh, do you mean to share screen? You didn't share. Screen. Oh, I haven't. I haven't shared screen. Oh. Let's see. So she's talking about someone who isn't in focus, and therefore, he doesn't judge and he doesn't form opinions and convictions. I'm trying you can read it. I'm just trying to find the most yeah. relevant. And okay, and, and this is the core of it. So she's saying you can observe them everywhere. And the examples she gives, I'm maybe I'm being nitpicky, but a lot of examples in throughout uh, when I'm reading Brandon's, I'm not sure if they're real or not. Like they, they seem a little bizarre. And, and then it, it puts in doubt the concept too sometimes. So so she's basically saying, okay, so there's a guy called a social metaphysician. He solves his psychological problems um, and his fear of other men by not being in focus and therefore not judging. And then she's saying, you observe them everywhere. This is one example, but I could find you others from the book. So, but I, I'm not going to, it's just this. From the mother who sits fondly watching her child playing with the neighbor's children. And if you ask her if a child is a cruel little brute or is it rational and self-confident or is terrified of other children or is a full fledged altruist, she would literally have no idea. It's just, that seems like such a bizarre example to me. And then yeah, me too. she watches solicitly over a ch children, child's physical well being, but doesn't take the trouble to pass a judgment on the character, which is forming and acting before her eyes to the employee. And then she gives more examples. Anyway, this example, there was something so off in my mind. And then I was thinking about the rest of what and what was said in the book. And I was like, well, hang on a second. How 
if these are the examples, then what about some of the concepts? And then she says, um, it's somehow like, and she, she also gives the analogy of watching a TV in full focus and not in full focus. And I guess my, my question, well, one, it's a bizarre example, but even putting that aside, my question is, um, in this passage, it seems like she was saying, all you need to do is focus and suddenly like you're forming judgments. But even, even if I like, okay, my understanding is focus is pay attention. But even if I pay attention, I don't know what to judge. I don't know when I should judge what's relevant, what's not relevant. Would, wouldn't you agree that in, in, the, in focusing, I can't really, um, like focusing is only good if I already have certain abstract principle. Well, it, focusing is good all the time, but the point is to focus and judge is something you only do when you already have abstract principles and standard by which to judge con specifics, right? Like a lot of people yeah. don't. And so um, it doesn't matter if I'm given my understanding in focus, it doesn't matter if I'm in focus or not. Like I can sit on the sofa, which I've done before and be in full focus, trying to think about what were the principles I acted on in the day. And I have no clue. So what are your thoughts on her passage here? Well, she, she later seems to be saying that she gives these examples and she gives them examples of people not in focus. And if they were in focus, they'd be passing judgments. Um, well, I don't like her example because I don't know if that's even that common of that type of a parent, they would usually pass judgment, I think, on something or other. Um, I think so too. I would think though that, well, for one, she is saying that you can't judge without focus. There's that much. I mean, without focusing you, you can't be judging. That's true. Or your judgment is relative to your focus. You can only judge as strong as your focus permits, um, yep. there's that. And we could say doesn't form opinions or convictions in the sense that maybe he makes insignificant judgments that seem relatively unimportant, say, whether they make you smile, like it's really, it's really insignificant or whether you like their clothing, like, I mean, your convictions might not go further than surface level like that you're not focused any deeper than the thought of the basic perceptual level. So we can have that kind of distinction too. And I think that's kind of what she's trying to get at with a bad example. But I think that's the sort of thing she's saying about, and I don't know how common it is, but I've definitely seen some people that barely pass judgment or that any judgment is, is restricted to surface level. But, uh, okay, that's interesting, that distinction between uh, superficial, surface level perceptual judgments and judgments on character. But how do you know if that's an issue of focus? Because what, okay, someone's, someone sees someone else and they're like, oh, I like that, that person, they have nice clothes. How, yeah, like, how do you know that's not full focus? That I don't get that. Why, why isn't that full? Like, if you're in full focus, like, to, to be in full focus means you're alert and open to new information and you're trying to recall relevant information in mind in this situation or to this person, but it, is it not? Um, like what why does I don't see why full focus suddenly implies some deeper level judgment on character that I just I get I well that's my understanding of focus is I'm just paying attention but it's not it's not yet um, I may not have the abstractions to pass some deeper level judgment it would seem least, that as far as I'm aware wait, focus is one thing and then judgment is a further method so i don't think being in focus necessarily implies judging okay i mean it can but it's like a necessary 
it's a requirement. Okay. But I mean, it's, it's a different method. It's not like you're focusing, which necessarily implies judging as much as you might be focusing. And then you could further apply judgment or not. But also right. I know it might be hard to know, are they just applying judgment incorrectly? Okay. I don't know how you can always tell whether it's incorrect judgment versus they're not even judging. Yeah. Okay. That, all right. I need to put that one aside. Okay, but not focusing is harder to say. Um, it would have more to do with whether they're even able to apply a judgment. Like if you're just on the surface level and unfocused on anything in particular, then you wouldn't be able to judge even if you wouldn't be able to get them to judge. You couldn't like introduce right. an example and then they could judge because, well, they're not in focus or maybe right. the most obvious example would be if somebody's drunk that they wouldn't even be able to formulate an answer correctly, let alone judge it correctly. Yeah. Like they're not in focus enough to even formulate their thoughts. Okay, what about, let's say you're speaking to a friend and they're on their phone and talking to you at the same time and they're sort of half distracted. Could you say, when I think of the focus in that situation, they're focused on their phone and their heart like a little bit focused on you, but overall, is that a state of focus or less, less focus? How do I, like, obviously there's a distinction between that and that they don't have the phone with them and they're just looking at you and talking to you. And you could say almost that's a higher level of focus on one thing, but then when they're looking at their phone, it's not, it's focus on the phone, less focus on you. But overall, is there a state of, could you say anything about their state of focus? maybe that it's not consistent because I mean, I could see somebody going to you, to the phone, to you, the phone back and forth. And you can't do both at once, but you can shift your attention back and forth. And yeah. you could say that it's unstable focus or inconsistent focus yeah. of whatever it might be, which can cause other issues because harder time integrating information, That's keeping right. up with the discussion, remembering what was just said, things like that. It gets a that's kind of distraction there. It takes much more work to recall what was just said because you got all the other two things interfering. So it, it's more of a interference with your focus rather than not focus, I would say. Could I, could I say that anytime I don't have a clear explicit purpose, I'm less than focus? I would say so. Yeah. Okay. That there's, it's more, yeah. If you don't have much of a purpose in mind, it's just wandering probably. So Not then even. that example of the friend who's checking their phone on some level, they have a purpose, but if you zoom out to a more abstract, I don't know how to say it, a more abstract macroscopic level, what is their purpose? It's less clear, right? If they're switching attention between the phone and you, then you could say there's less focus than if they were just focused on one thing with a clear purpose of I'm talking to this person. Maybe, I don't, I don't know. I'm just trying to concretize. We that. could call it ineffic inefficient, even that if you do have a goal, you would usually pick one or the other. Right. You, you can't do them both at once. Right. You can't, I mean, you could decide when you do it, but you can't do them at the same time. Right. There's yeah, gotta be okay. a choice. If you try to do both, you actually end up just doing one, then the other back and forth. Usually it doesn't yeah. end up as actually better at all because you're just inefficient overall. Yeah. Okay. All right. That makes sense. So this distinction between epistemological and metaphysical, I, I broadly understand. I think it's epistemology I know has something to do with thinking or methods of thinking. Metaphysical has to do with reality independent of consciousness, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And then 
they they go on to make this distinction between definition. So Aristotle referring to a definition being a metaphys metaphysical essence. So in the thing itself, and then okay, so they're talking. They she she mentions that he thought it was about some direct intuition. Objectivism regards it as epistemological. And then there's this distinction between the fundamental and the uh, essential. I, if you're familiar with that distinction in this in this in this pamphlet, yeah. where she she says that the fundamental is, I think it's when I well I've heard someone describe the fundamental as metaphysical and epistemolo and the, sorry and the essence is epistemological. But in a sense, aren't they both? Aren't they both epistemological? Um. Because I would essence think is, so. yeah. I mean, I've never really used a distinction between fundamental and essence. I mean, you could say maybe fundamental being what you know to be the case, what you know is a fact, and essence being, I'm not really even sure, actually. I never would really I, distinguished. Would I be right to say that entity is epistemological? Like, pretty much everything is epistemological, right? Because entity, the only reason I see and perceive an entity is because my senses form into all this data into percepts. But in reality, everything is simultaneous that I get like there's air, there's no nothing between me and air, there's just me. And uh, well, I'm, me is uh, epistemological, but you know what I'm saying? There's all these things moving around, but we only call them things because we're human. Otherwise, it's just, it's all one thing. And so in a sense, is not is it fair to say anything is metaphysical? Like, don't you just go, basically every distinction we make is epistemological. Well, in a way, but I think the importance is that, it's important to acknowledge that there's things that exist by their nature, which isn't established by your mind. You can recognize relationships but those relationships exist regardless of your judgment even. That would be epistemological okay. to give it okay. a name, give it a reference, but the relationship itself as it exists isn't something epistemological. It's not established by your mind. It's not recognized by your mind. It just exists that way. The epistemological is the identification of it. I would say okay. Okay, that I you're see. identifying is what makes it epistemological. You've done okay. some process and created something new in your mind okay. versus uh, the reference out there that you're referring to. Okay, I, I understand. So th there's a need to make, there's some usefulness in this making this distinction between like our, our mind, our, our mind and its relationship to reality. And there are certain concepts like uh, hierarchy maybe that you, you want to be able to describe. And so the useful distinction to make is epistemological versus metaphysical. It, that's yeah. it, right? Okay. And Rand makes the distinction that the bridge between the two is measurement. That measurement establishes what the relationship is. I mean, it's epistemological in one sense that you pick the standard, but the standard is the way it functions is set by the rules of reality. Like whatever standard you use to judge say color i mean that relation that thing exists still whatever you're judging still exists regardless of what you measure it things like that okay I mean, that's, measurement is the key to it's the objective way to ground your references in something out there in the world something connected that isn't dependent on what your mind has created okay all right, I uh, I'm I'm getting a, a bit closer to understanding that, although it's still yeah. not, it's probably not that important right now anyway. I don't okay. I could probably answer this myself. I don't think there's a difference between. I think when you say you identify an axiom self consciously, it's it's just referring to. I don't think I think the distinction is just there to. So self-consciously is you're referring, you're aware of it explicitly, that that's all it means. And so you're able to come back to it and use it as some reference 
which you can you explicitly hold in words and and keep looking at that self-consciously that's my understanding of difference between consciously and self-consciousness like what's meant here seems like it because they say identify them consciously and self-consciously as if they're the same thing as if they're different things sorry what could the difference be Well, I, I think consciously just refers to the fact that it's implicit. And so you don't need to formulate any, I'm just thinking about it now. It's implicit Ide existence, identity, conscious is implicit in your functioning and consciousness. And so you're conscious of them all the time, whether explicitly or implicitly in any given state of awareness and self-consciously is just there to capture this is my interpretation of it now and self-consciously just captures, uh, when you've reached the stage of conceptualizing them explicitly and being able to validate the knowledge by reference to those to make sure it conforms with them something like that thoughts well as long as conscious refers to just being aware not it's not like outside your attention it's just there but self-conscious does seem to emphasize explicit that's what it seems to be existence and identity are not true. when i start getting into these like big abstractions i'm uh it's it's less clear like when i ask that question of does every entity have a fundamental like does it have to have a fundamental uh i get lost in these kind of because they're so broad these things let's see um okay existence and identity are not attributes of existence they are existence consciousness is an attribute of certain living entities but it is not an attribute of a given state of awareness it is that state yeah so identity is existence is that uh, they're the same thing I'm, I'm confused in this like so identity is the fact that something something is and existence is Well, keep in mind that existent isn't necessarily a concrete thing. What do you mean? Like concepts are existence, even though okay. they're not like an object in the world. Um, it's just saying that things don't, you don't say like, there's an object, there's a ball. What are the characteristics of the ball? One is existence, another one is identity. But Ren is saying, no, it's not. It's not like that. It's not like it, an object has existence in that kind of sense. Oh, it's really? Okay. Like existence is broader than the concept of whatever the existent is. This seems to be what she's saying. That like there's existence, all of it, and then there's things within existence. Existence has entities, or existence has existence. Does exist within something like that or oh, okay okay and it's same with okay, consciousness so... like uh, i'll just get this idea out being that consciousness you could say is a it's not just saying there's in say humans humans have consciousness humans have a state and they have a state that's consciousness a type of no. humans have states and consciousness is a type of state um it's not a given a truth of the state it is that state oh, okay all right and and then identity so she's saying it's the same thing with identity you don't okay so you don't say this ball has existence and that's an attribute of the ball you say the ball is an existent and in, in existence, there are existence. I know that's confusing, but I'm just trying to get my head around this. Yeah, and then that, the ball, that one, yeah. And then what about the ball? But you do say the ball has an identity. The ball has identity. And at, but but that's yeah. the same issue, isn't it? Like you, you can't say an attribute of the ball is identity. 
yeah, I don't know. I think I would apply existence to like a ball, I'd say. An identity would be something like the color red. Like red has identity. Know that there's an identity and red is a kind of identity. That's how I would think of it. Because red okay. isn't existent. Okay. So you can't just say red has identity, rather the identity, there's an identity, and that red is a type of identity. I think things like that. And okay, so existence. Can I say existence has identity? I think so. Yeah, <laughs> that makes sense. That seems fair. All right. But I think you couldn't say that that um, an object and it there's an entity, and then it has existence because that's like reversing the hierarchy. I mean, existence is wider than an individual ball because it captures everything. Right, but so is ident isn't so is I same with identity or is identity only something that's there because there's some way to distinguish between different parts of existence, if that makes sense. It's identifying causality, really, but to say identity, well, identity is existence, and to have existence is to imply identity. So as far as an existence goes, I mean, these axioms come well, first. You could have existence, you could have just one big blue expanse. I think that was the example right. he just gave. And then with nothing, yeah. well, I mean, we're calling it blue, but there's nothing but this expanse. And yeah, then there's no, I don't even know if identity applies there, but I don't know this, this, to be honest, this is so, this, when you get this abstract, it's so easy to just uh, trip it over is. and mince your words. It's very and, easy. No. That's not usual, but I would yeah. say that Rand is saying that existence and identity, those are primary. Those are the okay. things that primary in the sense that everything is, it's an abstraction of everything else or not an abstract. It's a, it's wider than anything else. It's a wider reference than anything else that you say. Yeah. So it can, uh, everything is subsumed by that existence and identity. It's not that all things subsume existence, but or all things or existence, and then there's everything less than that, everything more narrow. Okay. You couldn't have it, it go the other way. All right, let's let's move on from that one. I don't. It's confusing. Okay, let's see what this is. Yeah, so I, I didn't get this passage, I think. Um, yeah, this, this passage was dense. <laughs> It's so, so dense. Like, I, I didn't get how, I didn't get why. Okay, so she's talking about forming axiomatic concepts by mental isolation of metaphysical fundamentals is epistemological and then well, maybe she's talking about the process. Is that what she's saying? She's saying the process is epistemological. It relates to man's knowledge. But now she, when she says, but metaphysically, it is an act of integration. To me, that's also epistemological. Isn't integration epistemological? Yeah, I'm not really sure here. Metaphysically is an act of integration. I mean...
personality is abstract. I'm not really sure. Yeah, okay. All right, let's see what else there was in this. Um, yeah, I think, okay, I, I can see my question here. I think where I was confused was it seemed like in this passage it was being said that forming the concept is epistemological, but integrating is metaphysical. And at least that's how I read it. And I know that's that's not right, but I, I didn't get how else it could be. Yeah, that wouldn't sound right either to me. Yeah, I don't think that's what she meant, but then I don't I don't know what she meant. So right. And then what about what's all this stuff about time? Like time seems to be some so the measurements omitted from axiomatic concepts, all the measurements and measurements of all existence subsumed. Okay, the see. only thing that is retained is time. That's but I am trying to get my head around that. The fundamental fact is retained independent of any particular moment of awareness. Yeah. So time is the time is the CCD. Sounds like it. <laughs> Isn't that bizarre? I've thought about this before too, but it's a difficult thing. I mean, time is what's seems to be a unifying thing it's a weird thing to think about <laughs> it's so weird time time is all that's retained which is true i mean it's referring to a particular moment in time usually not just all times but this moment in time that's where it gets philosophy gets weird i mean do you say that the past ever existed or you say it just went out of existence forever. Like, does it exist in relation to, to now or does it not exist at all? That's kind of weird to say. It is weird. In a way, you would say, like, does the baby Jonathan exist? No, he doesn't. But in some sense, he does because it's directly, it's what you were in previously. So does it, it's weird to say. I don't even yeah. know. <laughs> okay well i'm glad i'm not the only one who's confused, confused by this i well it is i guess one thing i can see how if you can get your head around this in a grounded way that would be amazing but it's like it's hard enough to just <clears throat> be grounded on something as simple well, relatively simple as rational like rationality objectivity and then so now you've got this which is you're thinking about everything Yeah. Okay, let's move on. Maybe we'll save it's uh that one's difficult. Yeah, you're just saying time is the only one retained. Um I still I still can't get my head around that. That's the most I can even say, but so we'll move yeah. on. <laughs> okay. How does she even? How did? You, how do you even get to that point where you, where you come up with a formulation like that? Reading a lot of philosophy it makes me think of. I tried reading Heidegger once. It's <laughs> it's like that, but every sentence is that way, and like the whole book that way that's it's like 300 pages being in time that's what the <laughs> book is called <laughs> oh man it's like but uh it would be good to find a professor who's studied that intensely and then just pick yeah. his brain because then you've got some standard to know like yes. i'm really confused by this and you see if this is an expert you see what his level of confusion is and you're in a much better position to judge. I yeah. don't know how they, how anyone stays grounded or logical in any way when they get into that kind of level it's of hard. abstraction. Okay. So let's see what this is. Axiomatics are the cognitive integrators that identify and thus protect its continuity. So man's consciousness. 
Okay, so that's all good, but I, I'm, I, it's hard for me to see that in the concrete. Like, I, I don't, you know, I'm not daily. I'm not thinking about axiomatic concepts at all. No. And so I'm this idea of them being protecting the continuity of my consciousness to me is, I don't have any grounding for that. Um, yeah. I'm just thinking of how you can recognize any concept you refer to. You can recognize that is relationship to an axiomatic concept. I mean, there's that much, at least you can, I mean, they're constant. They're always there. You, there's never a time when you can't see it or can't find it. Right. I mean, that kind of protects the continuity because it's the one continuous fact that applies across all things that you ever think of. It's not like you're going to come up with something and say, oh, that violates existence. That violates something else, even contradictions. You recognize right. they come from something. They come right. from some function of your mind. But right. either way, everything's continuous with all, all the concepts are continuous. And if you have the concept, the axiomatic concept, you can recognize it explicitly. And that can only help recognize that continuity. And this psychological time measurement she's speaking about is that this that's what she's saying before that all existence if you want to get to the level of abstraction of existence exists then your your ccd is time it's... you retain that as the the essential but the the measurements of time are omitted yeah okay that measurement's there always but all right. i get that i i the last question i get i get that it's implicit in all concepts and all yeah. all awareness but um the psychological time measurements that's an odd phrase it is an odd phrase. well she this defined it better what I mean, just any sense of time, I guess. Yeah, I mean, when you talk about existence, you're, um, you've omitted a particular measurement of time. We I mean, you know there's a time in which all these things exist, but you have no particular time. So, you know, I, I, identity even applies to the past. Anything that used to exist still has a time measurement related to it. And uh, this passage, the cognitive integrators, so the axiomatic are the cognitive integrators that identify and thus protect its continuity. So they identify consciousness. Cognitive integrators. They in identify. The that, yeah, they do identify, but in the sense that imagine you had like a, a honeycomb and, and each spot had a a concept, but you have to have something to connect them all together. So you connect them all together with the axiomatic concepts. It's the okay. glue that holds everything together. It, the axiomatic concepts are glue. They hold all right. your concepts together. It's right. what the web of concepts is what they're made out of. Okay. And, but if, if this is true that, okay, I, I can see that it's implicit in everything, I guess, where I'm getting stuck is that, okay, this is so important. And yet it's so hard to pull out obvious examples of day to day, how like use of axiomatic concepts helps you. You know what I'm saying? Like, here's yeah. this thing, which is fundamental to everything that is a protector of the continuity of my consciousness. And yet I could not, I could tell you, oh, I need to eat food. Like if I don't eat food, I'll get hungry. If I don't drink water, I'll get dehydrated. Like it's obvious, but if we're talking about axiomatic concepts, it's like, the, it, I, I can't think of it in those terms. I can't be like, oh yeah, here's what happens when I ignored the axiomatic concept or I didn't re recall them, you know? Yeah. Um, I should be able to do that. If I should be, I think I should be able to do that because it's so fundamental 
and you need them explicitly, but it's not, I can't think of good examples. So you know what I'm saying? It would always be implicit, at least even in your behaviors, I mean, in, the, in the way that if you go hunting, you would know that all the facts about hunting are related in some way to existence that whether you need a spear to hunt something, how to identify the tracks of the animal, how to kill the animal, how to protect yourself. All these things are related to, in some ways, not that they're isolated in different planes mm -hmm. of reality. There's something that unites all these things. There's a relationship between all those facts, at least being true in reality, that reality is what existence is what unites all these things together in a way that you can function in a way that's continuous across being alive across existence i i okay so uh take it somewhere else just because something i was thinking about like there was this <laughs> video clip of Feynman talking and in uh a journalist asked him well when i put two magnets together why why do i have that feeling between my hands and he went on this rant about why you can always ask why well why did aunt mary fall well why is the ice slippery well why are yeah. you know you can just keep going why infinite you can keep asking infinite why so yeah. why that you the answer to the why that you give is dependent on your purpose um and i was thinking about okay so all of existence we're saying knowledge is interrelated and on we're saying we're making that inference on the basis that existence is simultaneous in some in some sense right like it's yeah there, there's no uh which i said before there's no me and then a vacuum between me and other people there's a me and then a, a continuation of uh there's air and there's other things in you know that everything is one yeah. big thing and um when you're asking why is there ever like a point you get to where like a primary uh, that you can't go underneath for example yeah, it, you know if i yeah anyway go on well existence like why does existence exist well there is no why it's not a why like it just there's no prior cause to all of existence so would that mean though that the unit the existence is fully knowable in the sense that we can know every single thing about existence. It's within the grasp of human consciousness where all knowledge, just like um, that story in Borges where the guy looks into the Aleph and he sees everything yeah. at once and he has knowledge of every single thing in the universe, every particle down to yeah. the smallest, then that would be possible, right? Because if is my, I, maybe this is just stupid, uh, pointless abstract reasoning, but that would mean that you can, if existence is a primary, then, and we have um, a tool of knowledge to identify it and we can know everything. Um, is that line sense, of reasoning just a kind of too abstract or does that? No, that but would, I think it, it misses the analysis of what is free will, what is consciousness and then it gets complicated because okay. like, that's when it's not as straightforward. And you might have to use different things to account for it. But I mean, I think in principle, you could, but there's no time in the world to do that. Not to mention it's just, I don't know if you could even take into account specifically the choices people will make. So that's a whole I, different problem. I just find it bizarre. I know, I, I but it, let, let's imagine over a stretch of a billion years of human development, I just find the thought bizarre that we can get to the point where we know everything and there's no more to know. Yeah. I do wonder if that could ever happen. Like, is there an upper limit of what is knowable? But then you get into man-made things. Like to what extent do you, does something <laughs> man-made start to matter? Like, I mean, can you know automatically all the books that will be written, all the stories that will be written, all the movies that will be made, the paintings that will be made. And that's a different kind of, will you know what those will be? I yeah, don't know if you true. can know that ahead of time. I, 
I agree with that, but I, I guess more, I was thinking more in terms of like physical existence and not that's non-volitional. Yeah, I think with that you could in principle because there's nothing okay. that's something non-aware, non-conscious things. Like if you know how all the um, dominoes are placed and you press one, you know where the last domino is gonna fall. But those, it's just because they're non-aware, they are non-conscious, they're non-living. Yeah. That's really what it is. Yeah. For non-living things. It's a bizarre thought, but it's also, uh, to me, it's, it's, I don't know. It's cool to know that, oh, okay. You can just keep discovering existence and find more and more cool things to do and, you know, planets to settle on planets to explore or whatever, but obviously yeah. there's limits within our own lives because it's dependent on other human knowledge, but I've read books where people can live like a couple billion years. I think it's, <laughs> you travel galaxies, go to different <laughs> planets. You can stay a couple thousand years on a planet on your way to one that's 500 million years away. <laughs> Just imagine meeting, you're like, I'm finding a tutor, it wouldn't even be the internet, it would be some hyper, hyper dimensional yes. thing. And I find a tutor and, and it's like, it turns out my tutor's like 4 billion years old. Yes. <laughs> I don't know, that stuff's cool. Um, all right, let's let's wrap it up soon. So okay.